Hi everyone. Uh, thanks for sort of like coming back uh, after lunch to join us for our afternoon sort of present, uh, paper presentations. We have sort of like four presentations this afternoon. How we're going to sort of like try to structure to this afternoon's uh, uh, four very interesting sort of like stories is to sort of like divide it into two halves. Again, the first two papers will be sort of like followed by a, a sort of like conversation and Q&A, and then we'll sort of like proceed with the next sort of like uh, two sets of presentation. And to start off our afternoon's uh, panel, uh, I have, uh, I, she needs very, very, very little introduction. Um, in fact, I think all of you are familiar with the work of Jo Picantas and would probably have sort of like seen many of her sort of like productions over the, over uh, uh, in KL and, in this, uh, and possibly also in, in Singapore. Uh, today she'll be sort of like um, talking more broadly on this idea of, sort of creativity, about how we sort of like join dots and she'll be talking about this principally through a house at Kuala Kangsa Road, of, of a house um, of number 4A at Kuala Kangsa Road in Ipoh. And I think this is also a sort of like very personal sort of like uh, way of, sort of like thinking where you can sort of like draw your story sort of like from. And, uh, and after that, uh, she will be sort of like followed by uh, Professor Sugata Ray, uh, who is at uh, UC Berkeley. Uh, teaching art history, South, South and Southeast Asian sort of like art history at UC Berkeley, and he will be sort of like sharing, uh, thinking about similar sort of like global sort of trajectories, but principally looking at uh, history from the perspective of the sort of Indian Ocean. Um, uh, and I think uh, having the two papers together, one from a very personal sort of like locally rooted kind of like way of sort of thinking of a place, um, and then using that as a way to like span out into the concept of the world uh, in conversation with uh, how we sort of can think of the Indian Ocean sort of like history generatively and generously would be a, should be a quite interesting sort of like conversation to sort of like start our afternoon. So without much further ado, can I invite Joku Katas to take the floor? Thanks. Thank you, Simon. <clears throat> So I'm often asked this question, does it take a certain kind of person to be creative? So my very short answer is no. I think man is by nature a creative person, a creative being, meaning that man is a problem solver. And even if there are no problems to solve, he can't help looking at things and wondering how things could be better. His mind is restless and his imagination has no boundaries. He needs to research and investigate what he doesn't understand. A bit like babies. Um, all babies love wall sockets. There are three holes in the wall and three fingers between thumb and forefinger that fit really well into these three holes in the wall. So it makes sense to a baby to connect these fingers to these perfectly sized holes. You, can't, you can tell a baby no a hundred times, but next time they see a wall socket, they have to figure out its meaning themselves. So babies are curious, which is why they learn so quickly. They are trying to figure out the world around them. It fills them with wonder. So they need to investigate, they need to research. Some babies grow up to be, become people who specialize in investigating, specialize in researching, and sometimes we call these specialists scientists. And sometimes we call these specialists artists. So I think that all artists and sex scientists are a bit like babies. They never lose their sense of wonder. They're constantly trying to make sense of their surroundings. They're constantly trying to give meaning to the world that's around them. And I think this is why artists and scientists make up stories, because they're trying to explain this world that they see around them. Painters tell stories through maybe a single frame. Poets may tell stories through a poem or through a song. Actors and dancers tell stories with their bodies. Bees tell stories of honey through their bee dancers. And scientists tell stories with their theories. So we need theories and we need stories so we can know how to look at things and so we can learn and so that, very importantly, we can remember and make sense of things. Now, I don't think that artists and scientists are alone in this, having this need or this instinct or this des desire. As human beings, I think we all need to find a way to join the dots and we keep looking for dots and then trying to join the lines between them until some kind of pattern emerges. And of course, the world is a place of mathematical precision. You, know, you can see the perfect geometry everywhere, cell structure, patterns of trees, ancient forests. 
And we're always trying to find out the meaning between all these patterns. And even when there's a break from the pattern, that itself is a thrill, because this makes us see something which is an outlier. It's not part of the pattern, and it makes us excited and interested. So the knotted scar in a Persian carpet catches our eye, and it makes us feel the sense of what we call beauty, which is supposedly in the eye of the beholder. Or the coconut tree that is not growing straight up, but is growing sideways, bending over, trying to reach the sea. Now, we know the story of why it does that. It wants more sun. It's very simple. The other trees are blocking its way, so it chooses another way for survival. It's a good story because it helps us understand the behavior of this particular tree. So I've said that my topic is Archie and Mia, what a cockroach told me about art and creativity and the shortcomings of a cultural economy. But I'll come back to that later. But first, I want to get a bit more personal. I want to talk about my family home. My mother's family comes from Ipoh, specifically the address 4A Kuala Kangsa Road. This was my grandfather's house. It's still there, but much changed. I have no childhood photos of it. I spent strange periods of my childhood in that ramshackle house in the middle of what was then a kind of secondary jungle. And ever since I can remember, I have been obsessed with the inhabitants of 4A Kuala Kangsa Road, not just my grandparents and their 20 children, but also the dogs, the cats, the ducks, the geese, the kampong chickens, the catfish, the monkeys kept as prisoners, and house lizards who called it home. But my obsession did not end there. I was also obsessed with all the other long-time inhabitants of the house, and that is the objects that made their way to 4A from all over the world. Crumbling reproductions of the Hay Wayne were very much part of, part of my childhood. An onyx bowl from Egypt, a brass prayer tray from Jaffna, a spittoon, the ancient Kelvinator which never worked, the Bakelite switches, the photographs of Swami Vivekananda, the photos of the 20 children who were born there or in the nearby vicinity, all wearing caps and gowns as they graduated from universities from as far away as Dublin to Singapore to Melbourne, or their sun-bleached IC photos framed after their funerals and put on the walls with their fixed dead smiles, and the garlands from the dead evolving and growing over the years as more people died. Also, framed portraits of the Mona Lisa, a print from England. There she is. My grandfather's urn with his ashes, which waited a long time to return to Sri Lanka. Picasso prints stuck on bookshelves all over the house. And the silverfish books, and the silverfish infested books on socialism, tracks by Krishna Murti, a pamphlet supposedly from Chandra Bose's visit, a Japanese soldier's cap, or so we were always told, hidden copies, treasures of Bino and Dandy comics, the record player with a broken trumpet, the singer sewing machine with a broken pedal, the grandfather clock from Switzerland via Robinsons, images of Lakshmi, the goddess of wealth, and Saraswati, the goddess of learning, the incongruous chandelier donated by a Chinese Kongsi in gratitude to my grandfather for his war effort, three cupboards full of my deceased grandmother's saris, her cuticura powder, her hairpins, her home sarongs, her house coats, her beaded slippers, the Dresden shepherdess which had been turned into a lamp, the red vinyl sofa, the pipe from Asprey's, the Velvo tobacco pouch, the six high-back rosewood Chinese chairs with the inlaid mother of pearl, the statue of the poet Mirabai playing her sitar, the half-finished bottle of Napoleon brandy, the empty bottle of Old Spice. It is a museum. It is a repository of memories. It is a place to be imagined and reimagined and recast into different memories. It is a place of fiction and a place of invented memories as much as real memories. It is a gallery, and for the most part, it now exists only in my head. So I have to make sense of it, because I cannot remove them from my head. And one way to try to put order to this chaos of childhood is to try to join the dots between all those people and those animals and those objects and their migration and their travel. So I've been writing what I call my 4A stories, 4A Kuala Kangsa Road stories, trying to make sense of the global migratory connections of people, objects, gods, art, and animals. So here's a bit of a story from uh, one story called Going to the Dogs. 
which is a story of my uncle Sundran, who was the unmarried bachelor of the family, who stayed in the house long after everyone else had left and looked after my grandparents and looked after the contents of that house. When the family found out that Uncle Sundran had leukemia, no one knew what to do about the dogs. Who will take the dogs, they asked. They had already decided that Uncle Sundran was a goner, and each one, was, and each one were fearful that they were going to be the recipient of his fleeful canine legacy. They'll have to be put down, said Uncle Arjun brutally. They're not dogs, they're beasts. Uncle Arjun lived in Perth, in a house by the sea, and made regular pronouncements by telephone. The others were intimidated by Uncle Arjun and his knowledge of Picasso, the Mona Lisa, and something called the Hay Wayne by John Constable, a painting that he had brought back from England many years ago and hung in the living room of 4A Kuala Kangsa Road. Visitors to 4A were always forced to admire it. Grandmother, her eyes already cloudy with cataracts, would gaze at it with pride, admiring the golden pastoral landscape, the skies of cornflower blue, and the very expensive gilt frame. Hey Wayne, she would tell visitors, from England. But now grandma was dead, and the Hey Wayne by John Constable had become bleached by the afternoon sun. Lizards lived behind it, chortling and chuckling quietly to themselves before darting out to seize lazy blue bottles. Their messy eating habits left blotches on the idyllic English countryside. The family did not know what to do about 4A. Nobody wanted to live there anymore. Uncle Sundran had let the place go to the dogs. Chickens, dicks, chickens ducks going every which way they please, said Auntie Annen. It's a disgrace. But 4A had not always been like this. Once, it had been the center of the universe. The Mona Lisa hung in the living room. Every visitor who came to the, my grandfather's house thought that this Mona Lisa was my mother, 4A's eldest daughter. Is this Rosa, they would ask? Very nice, very nice. And they would admire her enigmatic beauty and mysterious smile. Grandfather loved 4A. He had built it for his ever-growing coterie of children, had cleared the land himself, a square hidden deep in the jungle. A quarter of a mile off Kuala Kangsa Road, you entered into a cool, dark forest. You bumped cautiously over rocks and earth, past the abandoned Tudor mansion, the ghost house pale among the trees. Outside the gate was a welcoming party. Two of Uncle Sundran's more talented mongrels, Mr. Barkley, his black and white, in his black and white tux, and the golden lady Godiva. Mr. Barkley, Mr. Barkley, you would cry, and he would go mad with dog joy, while Lady Godiva, plump and majestic, sat as serene as a cucumber sandwich and licked her bum. Every time any one of the 20 children got married, Grandpa planted a tree in that moist earth, until a towering canopy of green now shaded that ramshackle house. During the Japanese occupation, Grandpa hid a radio in a pillar of books, and a grateful Chinese community had given Grandpa a chandelier. He tried to give it away, but Grandma insisted on keeping it, and it hung incongruously in an old, dirty passageway. But now Uncle Sundran sat forgotten in 4A Kuala Kangsa Road. The aging dogs, the house scolding house lizards, and the ever-multiplying chickens his only company. My mother, the Mona Lisa, hung on the wall and looked down at Uncle Sundran, but neither she or I could reach down and help him, and he had no children of his own to care. Uncle Sundran had never married, the local Ipo matchmakers had told grandma and grandpa that Uncle Sundran was unmarriageable. It wasn't just the broken teeth or the lack of a law degree, though that was bad enough. There'd also been a scandal when he had broken off a perfectly good engagement. What did it matter if she had one lazy eye? The diary was good and the family were doctors, lawyers and engineers. But Uncle, Lingam, but Uncle Sundran was shy and he bolted. He saw the stable door open, said Uncle Dicky, and bolted. And now at other people's weddings, the marriage mummies treated Uncle Sundran the bolter to peacock displays of hostility, stalking past him and regrouping in prize to adjust hairpins and buns and opinions. And when the matchmaking mummies arrived at 4A with proposal of marriage for the 13 younger siblings, he would hide in the library. He would pretend not to see me as he crouched there, hiding from everyone else, but we could all hear the murmur of satisfactory marriage transactions. So while the others opened law practices and did wonders in a newly opened Malaysia, Uncle Sundran looked after 4A. He saw to the running of the household and the dogs. <laughs>
acting like an obstinate dung beetle. It wasn't that the untidy inhabitants of 4A did not care, but they were a large family and they had their own personal tragedies. Unmarried Auntie Pepe sat peddling her old singer sewing machine, making geometric dresses that got shorter as she grew older. Auntie Kudu, whose efforts, whose infamous uh, glamour and fame beauty had dazzled men from Ipoh to Melbourne, wept angrily in the kitchen at her husband's many infidelities. And even worse, Auntie Apu's husband Mahendran had a new Punjabi girlfriend and grandma's turkeys were keeping everybody awake all night. But Uncle Sundran toiled on, unseen and invisible. He lived in a black hole across the courtyard of the open kitchen. But sometimes a new man would emerge from this black hole and he would find us in the library reading Bino and Dandy and hiding from childhood chores. And there he would tell us stories Amongst the steadily chomping termites and snoozing dogs, he would tell us exciting stories about the plantations, about the wild boar that almost gored him once, about the owls on the plantations who rested on his arm. And he told funny stories, like the one about the crocodile and the cha siu pao, which is why you must never pass the Chinaman shop without buying at least two cha siu paos in case of crocodiles. But after grandma's death, he went mad. He slept on the floor of her bedroom for months, weeping and inconsolable, keeping everything intact. Her house coat with the safety pins, her cutie curum talcum powder. The dog stood outside and howled. They gave him Prozac, told him to cheer up, but he could not. He tried desperately to cheer up, but everybody had moved away and soon it was only him and the dogs at 4A Kuala Kangsa Road. He felt his life slipping away. And now, Ill with leukemia, he sat alone and contemplated the future. For 40 years, he had toiled at 4A and he did not know why. Grandpa no longer lay on the red vinyl sofa drinking brandy and hooting with laughter. Instead, he sat on an urn, in a silver urn high on a shelf, waiting for one of his children to return him to Salon. Once upon a time, Uncle, Link, Uncle Sundran had dreamt about being a lawyer. For Uncle Sundran, law meant justice and utopian dreams of a good society where the meek would inherit the earth. But he was not a good student. His nervousness made him... Sorry. Um, he, did not, he did not have Uncle Lingam's mad genius and photographic memory. He just had mad ideals. Just study and pass, Uncle Lingam would say. What's... Uh, just study and pass, Uncle Lingam would say. Um, but Uncle Sundran could not. In the library, he tutored the younger ones for their senior Cambridge, reading Great Expectations and Macaulay's History of Empire under the stern, house of the, uh, stern eyes of the house lizards. The dogs scratched their fleas and waited for the lessons to be over. The yellow lights blazed all night. At the various graduation, Grandma, resplendent in saris of red and gold and green and purple, would receive all congratulations generously. My father was a scholar, you see, Tamil scholar. This Cambridge exam all is nothing for us. And everyone nodded politely and pretended not to know that a father had drunk himself to death, having lost his money in Kuala Kangsa's notorious Chinese gambling dens. But finally, Uncle Sundran did go to London. Grandma packed his bag, socks and underwear, and a moth-eaten great coat belonging to, his, belonging to her father. She also packed his favorite deity, Saraswati, the goddess of learning. For years, Saraswati had hung opposite the Hei Wain, this one, in the, in the 4A living room, contemplating the gold and blue English countryside and watching the inhabitants of 4A come and go. London was heathen, Grandma said, and Saraswati would be a comfort. Besides, she thought, Saraswati might enjoy a change of scenery from 4A. Saraswati had her doubts. Grandma had also bought Uncle a bottle of Old Spice Cologne. Now she hid it in his bag. She didn't want to hand it to him publicly. She disliked these newfangled displays of affection. She had already brought a new sari to wear to his send-off. What else was there? At the airport, Grandpa gave him some 10-pound notes and everyone waved goodbye to the aeroplane. But Uncle Sundran went to London and fell apart. London confused him. The rain, the tram, the smogs, the baked beans. The post-war post world swirled around him. The horror of partition the brutality of Stalinism, the disintegration of Lanka, British law with its clipped wigs and, and insistence on torts and trusts was not equipped to deal with any of this. He no longer believed in the virtue of British law.
His mind became fevered. He's failed his exams once, twice, three times. Grandpa sold a piece of land to send him money, but he felt himself undeserving and settled in squalor in Bayswater for a shilling a week. 4A Kuala Kangsa Road was a long way away, and he could no longer smell the warm earth or the sweet sticky smell of honeysuckle that grew outside the girl's bedroom. He remembered the soft 4A perfume of flowers, damp fur and feathers, and gently farting dogs. He remembered the smell of frying cardamom and fenugreek and balachan that periodically burst out of the kitchen and brought the house to a pungent standstill. London smelled of grey iron railings. It was a taste of metal on tongue. He never grew to love the mineral smell of London rain, never knew the biting olfactory pleasure of cold, wet pavements with its veins of slag and ore. His nose searched for something familiar in the fog yellow city and found nothing. No hay wane, no sky of cornflower blue, no scent of freshly mown grass. Dismayed and disillusioned, his nose lost its way of smell. His nose lost its sense of smell, and Uncle Sundran lost his way. So that's just an excerpt from uh, the story, the beginning um, of the story. Um, so I just will tell you very briefly that what, what happens is that when he goes to London with the framed picture of Sarah's with he, he eventually meets his landlady who becomes very kind to him, uh, who's very kind to him because um, he has an epileptic, epileptic fit on the same day as independence is declared in Malaysia. And in, doing, in having that fit, she takes care of him, and so he gives her the goddess Saraswati. Now, the whole time that she's been in London, she's not been very happy. Nobody, um, it's cold, it's damp, there's nothing to see in the flat in London. But the woman who is then given this painting eventually takes her with her when she then leaves London and eventually, years later, finds herself in an old folks' home out in the countryside. And one day, she's carrying Saraswati's picture under her arm because she is lonely and bored. And she shows Saraswati the outside world through this window. And suddenly, Saraswati feels completely at home because what she sees is the world of 4A Kuala Kangsa Road because she sees the same landscape that was there in the, in the uh, painting of the Hay Wayne. And suddenly, she feels that she belongs. This is familiar. This is comfort comforting. This is comfortable. And the story has these sorts of connections with these objects traveling and finding new meaning in all places, or those objects going to a foreign country and finding new meanings in those um, supposedly foreign countries. So I think what I'm trying to do with the piece is trying to understand what is this migration that we look at and in what way can we look at it. And I'm just interested in this idea of these objects, these people, these gods, going and having other meanings for other people. Eventually Saraswati is given to this woman's niece who then you know, gives it you know, wine at Christmas time, puts a candle in front of it. So Saraswati also becomes a bit Christian. She comes to like the smell of boiled cabbage, whereas in fact, initially she had really hated it. Um, so all these objects take on new meanings and um, take on new sensibilities when they go to different places. Just as the Hay Wayne, when it came to 4A Kuala Kangsa Road, stopped being a um, a pastoral English paradise that became a bit of a tropical paradise with lizards living on it and um, it being bleached by the sun and it took on another nature uh, for itself. Now I've already gone over my time. Five minutes. Um, so I just want to, uh, I won't come to this, we'll skip this bit because um, it doesn't matter now. <laughs> um, but I think I just want to say that why we need stories and I think that human beings, we have an urge we have an instinct to make, make art. And this instinct is the same instinct that makes the coconut tree grow across the water. Um, but our instinct is complicated by three things, uh, education, society, and self-doubt. And I say education not in its best sense, but in its worst sense, in the sense of uh, the character Mr. Gradgrind in Charles Dickens' novel, Hard Times, where Mr. Gradgrind sees the young people as little pitchers or jugs waiting for knowledge to be poured into them. This is Mr. Gradgrind. So he sees children and people as receptacles who don't change their shape. He sees education not as something that frees what is within, but something which he needs to fill you up with. So Mr. Gradgrind's way of education is a bit like pouring concrete. And unfortunately, I think a lot of the time, education is a bit like pouring concrete, which is why you end up 
pouring concrete into children. And so, which is why you end up with a lot of solid citizens, solid concrete citizens, but not enough people who are able to fulfill the potential which, which, which they are born with and that instinct to make art. Because concrete cannot fly. Concrete will not attempt to put its fingers into a wall socket in order to discover the connection between those holes and its three fingers. Okay, so I've got a lot more to say, but I can't, I don't have time to say it, so I think maybe I'll try to ad lib and wrap up about what I'm trying to say and come back to just this idea of um, trying, trying to quantify art. You know, I think the thing is that art is, education and art making is not just about information being poured into us. Education is, uh, like anything creative, is very hard to quantify. And the result of learning is hard to quantify. And the act of making art is also very hard to quantify. And we run into all kinds of problems when we try to do it. So recently, there's been a lot of talk about making a creative industry, a creative economy. And we are told that it's a good thing, that creativity gets results. But I think that sometimes some things are hard to quantify, and it's hard to quantify the results. It's not to say we shouldn't try to quantify it, but we shouldn't try to rig the results. So sometimes I wonder if in the race to make a creative industry, we're too guilty of trying to rig the results which, with results that would please those in power. We try to explain the use of art in utilitarian terms. So what happens? We learn to speak the language of utilitarian, utilitarian industries as well. But I think such a language can be dangerous for all of us. Um, I think the thing is that with creativity, creativity is all about trial and error, dead ends, false starts, mistakes, missteps, and putting your fingers in the sockets and getting a shock, and saying, I'll never do that again, and then doing it again. Creativity is about not knowing the outcome, but restlessly searching for a pattern. Your instinct tells you it's there. So sometimes when we try to fit things according to a timeline or a pattern imposed on us, we don't discover. We just make and reproduce what we already know can be done. But I think, I wonder how we can have a kind of creative space where we don't worry about making the right result, but just in trying to find out what is out there, what those patterns are, and trying to find those connections for ourselves, however long it may take, without feeling the need to quickly give a result uh, for other people to consume. And I'll stop with that. Much faster, I think. Thank you, Joe. Uh, thank you, Joe. That was very, very, very rich sort of like opening paper, following up, I guess. Uh, Sagata, you have a tough act to follow. Uh, but you'll be speaking uh, on a particular type of architecture that uh, seldom sort of like discussed in this part of the world. We often, most of you would know what the Indo Saracenic sort of like form of architecture is, right? Uh, do you know that term? You go to the Sultan Abdul Samad building, which is in uh, the Padang at KL, uh, the one with the sort of like uh, the dome roof sort of like shape that's normally called the Indo-Saracenic building, and that sort of like uh, uh, circulation of, of this particular sort of like form of architecture from India to this part of the world is, I guess, something that uh, is already sort of like uh, well researched. But uh, I think what Sugata is going to sort of like talk about today is uh, another type of. Uh, architectural typology, which is the neoclassical sort of like moss, and uh, it's sort of like circulation, this part of it has not been sort of like looked at, and using the Indian Ocean sort of history as a sort of like framework, I think you'll be, uh, be able to sort of offer a very interesting sort of take on this subject. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Sam. And then I am... So I'm going to follow up on Joe's story of 4A and try to think about another form of British art. We talk about the Hewain, but we'll talk about neoclassical architecture as an art. What, what does it mean to think about the Hewain, John Constable, or the neoclassical in the colony, in the tropics, so as to speak? So, in 1845, Fatima bin Sultan, Suleiman, a Malay shipping mer merchant, built a mosque in the Kampong Lam district in Singapore. As a widowed shipping magnate who had earned her money from maritime trade, her decision to build a mosque in Kampong Lang was hardly surprising. The area, marked in red, 
in the first plan of the city had been officially allocated to Muslim merchants from Southeast Asia and the Arabian Peninsula by Raffles in 1822. What is surprising is that the Malay merchant decided to build her 1845 mosque with a minaret reminiscent of contemporaneous British churches in Singapore. Embellished with a Tuscan pilaster, entablature completed with dental frieze, arched recess panels, parapets, and capped with an elongated steeple-like structure, this was the first mosque in Singapore to break from the city's distinctive mosque typology. A typology that all of us are familiar with, a typology that was characterized by a square plan and a pyramidal multi-layered roof. The oldest mosque in Uh, that's, that's the oldest mosque in Singapore, 1820. Uh, orig the original structure was based on the Southeast Asian mosque typology that was replaced by a brick mosque in 1855. Blurring the difference between an Islamic mosque and a Christian church, Hajja Fatima had dangerously destabilized an imperialist rhetoric that marked out the modern West from its Muslim other. Thus, blaming the Malay artisan's lack of skill for the slight tilt in the minaret, contemporaneous British newspapers in Singapore criticized Hajja Fatima for her tasteless appropriation of modern European architecture. What was at stake, however, was not merely a question of taste, but the colonizer's discomfort with the colonized attempt to wrest Western modern architecture. Writing in 1862, the British architecture historian James Fer Ferguson would corroborate. Of course, no native can understand either the origin or the motive of the various parts of our order. In the vain attempt to imitate his superiors, he has abandoned his own beautiful art to produce the strange jumble of vulgarity and bad taste. Nothing could more clearly show the utter degradation to which subjection to a foreign power has depressed than the examples of the bastard styles just quoted. Ferguson's critique was not directed at the Hajja Fatima Mosque, but contemporaneous mosques and palaces built by the Muslim elite in British India for example, three mosques in Calcutta that was built by the son of Tipu Sultan, who was the legendary ruler of Mysore and a formidable adversary of the British East India Company, and who had formed alliances with France and the Ottoman Sultan to overthrow the British. Very similar in design, all three mosques in Calcutta were embellished with classical columns, rounded arches, four shut shuttered doors, reminiscent of neoclassical architecture of British Calcutta, the nodal point in an empire that spread across the Indian Ocean from Singapore to Aden and East Africa. And to give you a sense of how the mosques look like, this is the mihrab. So imagine praying in a mosque that looks like a neoclassical building. By this time, when Hajja Fatima was building his, her mosque in Singapore and the mosques in Calcutta were being built, the neoclassical, with its genealogies in the Palladian order, had already been established as a metaphor of British governance across colonized worlds. Despite the innumerable examples of the native who used this style we saw to already, in scholarship, the neoclassical style remains indelibly associated with the architecture of colonial governance. Architectural histories suggest that imperial edifices such as the government house in Calcutta, the parliament house in Singapore, or the central police station in Penang, which is now the legislative assembly, with their imposing facades, classical pediments held up by soaring columns, in linked the British Empire to the empires of antiquity. 
and a sharp contrast to the Islamic architecture of the Indian Ocean world, the neoclassical for the Europeans symptomized a transformation of the 19th century political order. We will return to this question of what is traditional Islamic architecture, but it was this architecture of governance, a representation of modern governance, that the indigenous elite appropriated to recreate the neoclassical as an architectural form of the colonized. We could claim, as recent uh, revisionist scholarship has done, that the appropriation of the British neoclassical allowed the native elite to claim a modern subject position within the colonial topos. We could say that in appropriating the vocabulary of the empire, a new language of power was created, a language that produced a space of modern Western habitation. But to merely claim for the colonized elite the specter of Western modernity would mean privileging once again the meta-narratives of European modernity, imperializing strategies of first in Europe then elsewhere. That is, the neoclassical emerges in Europe and it, is tra it transfers elsewhere and it becomes a way of becoming modern for the native elite. In instead of seeing this sort of a diffusion model that is an European architecture that is spread, spreading globally and the native are picking it up and becoming modern, I want to posit neo the neoclassical as a form of cosmopolitanism that emerged in and was constitutive of an Indian Ocean world in its various imaginative and geographic configurations. In the recent past, the term cosmopolitanism has conveyed a certain outlook of the world, a social and cultural condition, a political project, a political subjectivity, an attitude, even in practice. Given the conceptual in indeterminacy of the term, it one could talk about a cosmopolitanism of the Indian Ocean world. The Muslim actors in my narrative, in my story, resided in regional centers, Singapore, Calcutta, but were deeply linked through Indian Ocean trading networks. By the mid-19th century, Muslim traders were operating in port cities such as Bombay, Suez, Beirut, Singapore, Hong Kong, Trade was an important opening for architecture practices that made cosmopolitanism a constitutive feature of a Muslim self in the Indian Ocean. Consequently, new subjectivities emerged, subjectivities defined by the ability to see across wider seascapes beyond the particularities of a lived world. We return, we will return to the example that I began with, Hajja Fatima's 1845 mosque. But first, a detour, as we must, to 1720s, Imperial London. The Scottish architect, James Gibbs, had just completed St. Martin's in the Field, a church that would become the most significant building in the British Empire. Although the architect had originally imagined the church as a domed rotunda based on uh, the St. Paul's Cathedral. The final plan that was approved included a Corinthian, is there a Corinthian portico on which a steeple was stuck. This was a very innovative architectural innovation that brought together earlier Roman architecture with the neo of neoclassicism, and that's why the term neoclassicism is. That is, by using older classical elements from early Roman architecture, Gibbs came up with a very distinctive mannerist idiom of neoclassicism in 18th century England. As such, St. Martin's in the field is immobile, but through the publication of, of Gibbs' The Book of Architecture, one could call it the Gibbs effect, his architecture spread across the British Empire. For instance, we know that in the we know that the Topkapi Palace, that is the pa royal palace in Istanbul, it has a copy of Gibbs' book with Ottoman annotation. 
or there. Yeah. And you can see how someone in the royal palace has actually made annotation on Gibbs' book. In British North America, Thomas Jefferson acquired a copy of the book while he was a student at William and Mary. According to a 75 in advertisement in the Maryland Gazette, a certain architect announced that he could build on the basis of Gibbs' design. And in, England, in, in the US, St. Michael's is perhaps the earliest examples of North American churches that were modeled on St. Martin's. In British India, the colonial archive suggests that the Gibbs book was carefully studied by architects, for instance, the St. Andrews in Madras, which is based on the book that probably landed up in the colonial archive. So what we see in the 19th century is as, Saint, as Gibbs' book travels across vast oceanic spaces from North America to Asia, architects, mostly imperial British architects, who are using that book to create a new architectural paradigm of governance. The, this particular style lands up in Penang with the construction of St. George's Church in 1818. Singapore's architecture, too, was part of this larger Singapore's architecture, too, was part of this larger imperial network that connected the, the empire. In George Coleman, an Irish architect whose career had begun in Calcutta, designed the first church in Singapore in 1835. He, was, he knew Gibbs' style, for instance, he had seen these buildings in Calcutta before he was appointed to be the uh, superintendent of public works in 1833. Within 10 years, Coleman had designed a number of neoclassical buildings in the city, including parliament house, churches, as well as civic inf infrastructure. So it is, the, it is in this terrain of global imperialism, of British architecture in various colonies that we find Hajj Fatima, a Muslim merchant, turning to Gibbs steeple. Her objective is not to build a church, but a mosque. Built within 10 years of Coleman's church, Hajj Fatima's mosque incorporated certain elements of Gibbs' 1726 steeple that had now become a global icon. The question is, what compelled a Malay merchant to incorporate a Christian architectural uh, fabric, a Christian architectural element, and that even an element of colonialism, within her mosque? The mosque today looks, uh, look uh, as we see it now, was rebuilt in the 1930s with an Indic onion-shaped dome. What remains from the original 1845 construction is the front facade and the looming minaret that would have dominated Singapore's colonial landscape, as we can see from the In the 19th century, the mosque would have stood prominently on Beach Road, the main boulevard facing the ocean front. Now, if you look closer, a closer look, however, reveals that the architect, whose name we do not know, has incorporated Chinese glazed porcelain tiles in this austere neoclassical spire. The entrance is also crowned by a cantilevered wooden chamber. Such projecting chambers were part of an urban fabric across the Indian Ocean Islamic world. The, the term used in Persian is, is Roshan, literally the word for light, and it's used in Red Sea architecture. It's known as the Jharoka in Western India and the Mashrabiya in Egypt. While scholars are unsure about the origins of this architectural device, it was certainly part of an early modern Islamic trading network that connected the Arab worlds to Southeast Asia. Yet, 
much like the hybridity of the neoclassical steeple with the inclusion of Chinese porcelain tiles, the balcony too is indigenized with the use of a typical Southeast Asian pyramidal roof. And one could call this a mistranslation, and it is precisely this mistranslation, the lack of a veracity to the original while copying, which, whether it is the Roshan or Gibbs steeple, that indexes an Indian Ocean cosmopolitanism. Even a closer look at the minaret, which is supposed to be based on, uh, on Gibbs steeple, demonstrates the structure has a finial that was based on Mughal architecture from South Asia. And it is this failure, and British, British newspapers from the 19th century would write, it is precisely this failure to copy correctly that led to a certain uh, 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 lack of understanding. Architecture histories would say that, that indigenous artists are exceptionally talented copists, but they don't understand, they don't fully comprehend the logic of European architecture. And that is precisely why they fail to copy it correctly. Ferguson, the, the Scottish architecture historian, Ferguson, we might remember, had written that the native has abundant his, abundant his own beautiful art to produce the strange jumble of vulgarity and bad taste. Instead of seeing this vulgarity, bad taste, lack of copying as, as a failure, we might see it as a cosmopolitanism. The cosmopolitanism of this style combined architectural elements from the Indian Ocean world. And here I would argue the neoclassical becomes an Indian Ocean style when it is picked up by native elites. It can take us from Singapore to Yemen to the 46 meter minaret of the 1914 Al Midhar Mosque in Tarim. We know that there were trade networks between Tarim in South, South Yemen and Southeast Asia, and it which was strengthened in the early 19th century with Muslim merchants migrating to Indonesia, Malaysia, and India. Tarim's Hadrami Arabs were one of the first Muslim groups to settle in Singapore and establish the first mosque. In Tarim, on the other hand, Singapore's diaspora had started endowments to build schools, mosques, and public infrastructure. We know that Hajja Fatima, the patron of our mosque, had married her daughter to a prominent Hadrami family from Tarim, in process cementing ties between the Malay Muslim world, the Muslim elite in Singapore, and Yemeni trading communities in the Arab world. Such transregional familial and trade networks certainly impacted the architecture of neoclassical mosques. If in Singapore, the Roshan in Hajja Fatima's mosque gestured toward the Muslim Indian Ocean, Tarim's Al Midhar Mosque emphasized architectural connections with South and Southeast Asia. The, this particular mosque was built in honor of Sheikh Umar al Midhar, a local 15th century Sufi mystic. But in the early 20th century, the minaret, uh, a new minaret was built, which was very un. Oh, I'm so sorry, the slides are just. This is the minaret that I was talking about. So if you look at this particular mosque, the new minaret that was built in 1914 was completely different from traditional mosque typologies. And the one on the right is a 15th century, a 12th century mosque in Tarim. What is different is that the two cupolas of the Tarim mosque framing the minaret are, have their origin in European architecture in a similar way in which European elements enter Singapore's architecture and Calcutta's architecture, you have European elements entering Tarim's traditional Islamic architecture. What is also interesting that colonial administrators for, would criticize this westernization of Tarim's architecture. For instance, in For instance, in 1932, a book was written that said 
that this was a pity that the mosque was being renovated in a European style. As an act of translation, what was iterated here was a conception of the neoclassical that exceeded the term's original intention. Although the term has a specific meaning in Western art history that we can trace back to 18th century art history as well as the practice of James Kibbs, when it is used by the indigenous elite in colonies, it starts becoming something else. Mosques such as this in Singapore, Tarim, and Calcutta then opens up the question of what does it mean to appropriate Western form? From the perspective of an architectural history, it is easy to see how Muslim cosmopolitans in the Indian Ocean world redrew the contours of their world, not just through Western Europe, but through the translations of various forms assimilated from diverse networks of affinities. 19th century mosques in the Indian Ocean then open up this question of what is an Indian Ocean architecture. Now, one has to be careful not to fall into this trap of thinking about a Westernist imagination of traditional architecture, which can then act as a foil for the modern neoclassical. Many of you must be familiar of the, with these monuments. In Southeast Asia, the mosque was always hybrid, always transcultural. For instance, the minarets of 18th century mosque in Malacca had their sources in South India, China, even European typologies that complicates any simplistic idea of a traditional Southeast Asian mosque typology. The Southeast Asian mosque, scholars have described, was part of what is known as monsoon Islam, shaped by networks of trade and migration. What is different, however, with neoclassical mosques, as from earlier hybrid or, or mosques that were citing various sorts of style, is the appropriation of the colonizer's language of power and domination in a period when architectural history had clearly marked out the modern West from its Muslim other. To put it very differently, the modern discipline of architectural history had created this idea of a traditional Islamic mosque. It is precisely at this juncture, the question of the neoclassical opens up questions of how do we talk about mosque architecture that appropriate the language of power, the language of empire. Thus, Rather than seeing the bastard style of the colony, as James Ferguson would have described it, as merely a failure on part of the colonizer to fully understand European architecture, we might reconsider neoclassical mosques in the Indian Ocean world as a practice of translation that signposts the limits of Europe's claim to the universal. Reading the bastard style, not as a failure on part of the colonizer, but as translation, consequently allows us to make visible both the indispensability and the inadequacy of a Western art history. To translate failure into translation, then, is also the first step towards decolonizing or delimiting the legacy of Enlightenment thought as it structures the way we still think, write, and teach art history. Thank you. Do you guys want to sort of like sit out in front on the chairs? Um, for questions and answers. Uh, does anyone have any questions? We'll sort of like dive straight into it because we actually don't have a lot of time. Any questions? Come here from the floor. Do either of our speakers? No? Do you? Yeah. There you go. Hi. Uh, to, I have a question to Joe Katas. So when I was growing up, I had the unfortunate combination of being someone who likes to draw and to program. And I grew up with teachers who say that should not be possible. So 
given that our country has trained our people to separate the science and the arts for decades, I find your opening quite interesting because you're implying that creative people are also scientists. So how would you bring the two separate disciplines together? I think it's a very false separation that was um, perpetrated in our schools by streaming people that either you are of scientific bent or of an artistic bent, whereas in fact both of them are about inquiry, both are as human beings we're constantly investigating and whatever, whether it's sociological or it's scientific or it's artistic or it's literary, for me they're all the same sides of the same coin. And a few years ago I was working in Singapore and I was lucky enough to work with these uh, nuclear physicists on, on, on a project which had been uh, written by a Singaporean playwright. And when I met them, I really just felt I've never met more childlike people in my life. <laughs> and these were people looking at you know, particles in a way that I found really hard to fathom on paper. But when they talked about it, it made so much sense because they, they, they made me understand the story behind it. And I think for me, it's always that, that, that very thing, which then we use slightly different words or metaphors or diagrams or um, symbols to then translate for people to understand. And then we all develop our own jargon um, and our own symbols for our tribe. But really, it's, I think it's all the same thing. I don't know how to change it back in this country, but it's long overdue. Yeah. Okay. Um, is there another question? But maybe just sort of like following on the, the, uh, the, what you've sort of like talked about translation. Um, so much of, um, I guess, the way that academic sort of like knowledge is, uh, I guess, spoken of in terms of how it's sort of like contained within an ivory sort of like tower in Malaysia at least, is the fact that academics have sort of like failed to translate on so many sort of like fronts, right? Um, in your experience with working with, I guess, some of the principles of like centers of knowledge production in this country, do you feel like there are uh, interesting sort of like strategies that have been sort of like um, employed or has been sort of like tested in the past that would allow for these sort of like translations to work and maybe Sugata if you know of any sort of like examples from Berkeley how does Berkeley sort of like do it given that it's an institution with such a long-standing history of um, at least so uh, being involved in different kinds of like social movements and engagement that would require you to sort of like translate at times very sort of like dense and theoretical sort of like uh, uh, texts or ways of sort of like thinking through certain issues into possibly a movement, right? How would you sort of like think of translation? Um, so just go back to the beginning, the first part of your right. question, Simon. Um, I think that uh, if I look back at institutions that existed, let's say just post-independence or in the, in the 60s, there was a, artists were working alongside academics, artists were working inside academia. I, didn't, I don't think there was such a great separation. I think there's been a separation in the last 10, 15 years, and I think that maybe that's what you're trying to do, Simon, by trying to bridge it with the Cultural Center or the MDA to um, make deeper connections. But I know that, for example, in the generation of people doing theater in the 60s, People in theatre were working with poets, were working with artists, working with architects, were working because it was all about building this new nation. So that every form was all about rethinking your place. Um, and we were very, I think people were very keen to try to understand as a whole what is this place or this sense of this new country. And of course in the 60s, much more of a greater sense of maybe of, mo of movements was happening. I think now with um, art making becoming this thing where it, and I think this is why I was trying to talk about the dangers of looking only as a cultural economy when the purpose of making a piece of art is only to sell it elsewhere, then the lines of production become very rapid mm -hmm. and so there's less investigation. So I think maybe that's what's happening here and I think that if we can find new forms of, of slowing down that and that understanding that actually sometimes the research um, may take 20 years, it may take all your life and that there's no need to have such a quick outcome. I mean, I think that's why I was very interested in Michelle's prep room, because you know, she, didn't put a, she didn't put a deadline on things, and I think that allows artists to find out from a single, a single um, topic such massive and uh, far-reaching consequences, which I think is very 
helpful and important in art making. Um, sorry, Mr. Gata. Uh, maybe I should rephrase the question to connect it to your sort of like yeah, talk, but I'm right? Happy but to I wonder talk if, about yeah. the question of translation. I, I don't think it's a top-down right. process. At least as we've seen it work historically, students' movements are always bottoms up. Right. So I think any sort of practice of uh, any social movement, any sort of uh, praxis of change, has to come from the students in a way. So as we've seen it in the 60s, as we see it even now, mm -hmm. what's happening in Hong Kong, over and again, it's really a bottoms up thing. And I see our roles as academics, as intellect artists, uh, is in a certain way to, to narrate, to tell stories, to talk about this praxis, but finally, it, it, it'll, be, it'll be bureaucratic and governmental if right. we try to make change. Right. It has to come from the students who so are in our really way, it's really to sort of step aside. We step aside. Right. Our job is ends here, in a way. Mm -hmm. uh, Hong and uh, Ray. I guess I have a okay. microphone, so you have uh, to debate it. Okay, uh, link. Just making um, some links uh, to to this morning, and uh, and uh, the the you were talking about the beasts in the in the house, and and. Uh, and, and the, the death of the human then led to, well, what will, who's going to take care of the beasts? And, and the beasts this morning, the, the, um, uh, the leopard skin under the, um, uh, the, the, the woman who became the, the, the queen of the, of the festival in, in uh, um, the Philippines, or the, or the, the beasts who, which became human and, and, and uh, national and colonial metaphors, uh, the bull and the, and the tiger, the, the, and, and then uh, the, taking on the masks. Oh, so so these, the, the beasts then become a kind of a, a boundary, you know, but it's a permeable boundary um, with, so you have an exhibition, you have non-human species non-human entities and actants in, in the uh, exhibition, which then blow apart the, 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 the border, that blow apart the edge of the exhibition. It, it becomes something else. It becomes an area that we have very little knowledge of, in a sense. And what we do with that is we make then human metaphors of, of these non-human entities. And, and the architecture here, you know, serves to some extent the same uh, the, the same function. It, it blows apart the human, um, uh, um, it, it becomes the metaphor for the human gathering, the ritual that's inside of it. So I'm just very, just interested, it's just more of a comment that kind of linking these things together and, and what is an exhibition then? What, you know, if the border is permeable and the objects, as you said, in the house come from everywhere and, and, and their meaning changes according to the context that they're in. So, so I think that it's just a very interesting leitmotif that goes through here if, if we look at the non-human as an, as an actant, as a performance and performative uh, character in, in these, in these uh, um, pre presentations. I mean, I, I'm very interested in the idea of the non-human. I think sometimes I have to make sure that I talk about the human <laughs> uh, because the, the non-human is, is very present. And I think like with the idea of the dogs, for example, in, in, the, in the story, um, the death of the, of the human doesn't actually, um, in my story, become the death of the dogs or the end of the dogs because they have a stronger, longer life because their claim to the earth is that much longer than the human claim anyway. So I, I, I'm, I'm very interested in this idea of, of the beasts actually becoming, um, and be beasts and plants, basically, and things outliving humanity. Because yeah. so, even with the house, uh, the jungle will take over, things will take over, and it will be reclaimed by, um, um, yeah, by the earth again. Plants, animals, bugs. Um, oh, do you have a question? Or Sorry, yeah, do you have a question? Uh, yeah. Oh. So, um, first of all, thank you to both of you. It's a really this poetic, beautiful presentation as well as very informative. Um, so, uh, the sense that I get from both of your presentation is that um, ever since this, um, this point of like the modern period, the 19th century, 20th century, we, our future is pretty much hybridity. Like hybridity has become the future that we're 
essentially enacting and a very much active um, informants of this process. Um, so, um, so UNESCO recently named this year the years of the indigenous, in, indigenous people year and indigeneity. So I just feel like, at least personally for me, it seems like this clapback from colonial remnants and it seemed to cling on to this notion of indigeneity as very essentializing. As like, you have one origin, you come from here, you practice these things and that's about it about you. Like you're categorized, you put in a box and that's it. Um, and that kind of makes me think about how both of your talks, like in your, um, in Joe's, in your um, performance slash stories and Dr. Sugata's um, research in neo-colonial, neo um, no, I'm sorry, uh, neoclassical architecture and how it travels around the Indian, Indian Ocean, like it makes me think about the sense of like the post-colonial subject and how do we kind of situate that terms within the world that keeps pushing us back into the box, like we're out of it, different change, but there's this wave of pushing us back into it and boxing us in. So I'm just wondering, like, how do you define this term post-colonial, post-colonialism, post-coloniality? There's so many posts nowadays, I can't keep up with them. In your practice, and how do you respond or navigate to this, um, this kind of nationalistic wave of returning to the so-called origin? So, I mean, it's a huge question. I know, just, it's just it's to post it. Uh, but just to uh, parse out two, three points, and we could talk more later as well. Uh, and I'm sorry my images and my talk didn't match, but I was very clear that I wanted to be clear about this that hybridity is not a 19th century phenomenon, as we see in the 18th century. And that's why I had two examples of Malacca to show that, that hybridity, the sort of an idea of the tradition as, as authentic versus the modern as hybrid, it's really a colonial construct in a way. So I was trying to argue, ineffectively, because the images didn't match my talk, but that hybridity has always been constitutive of a Southeast Asian identity precisely because of its location in the world. And uh, that said, uh, what is interesting about 19th century hybridity, especially let's say constable or neoclassical, is that this is a hybridity that is in, in conversation, it's subverting, it's working with power in a very different way from let's say earlier modes of power. So when, when in the 17th century uh, mosque architecture is looking at, is drawing from South India, Dutch, China, that's a different sort of hybridity as compared to the constable in your house or neoclassical architecture. That is where we start thinking about uh, this question of a colonial subjectivity under, under power. And, uh, Indigenism, uh, it's, a, it's again a very, very broad question. Uh, I wouldn't sort of put indigen, indigenism away just because UNESCO, it's on the UNESCO website. Uh, I, I would, I, there's a very interesting essay by Spivak where she argues about strategic essentialism. In a way, if we think about indigenism as a form of essentialism, it can be a mode of resistance as we have seen over and again in a lot of activism, let's say right now in Native American act activism in the US, indigenism or imagined indig indigenism, I would say that is also a strategy, is a form of resistance. And I could, there are beautiful stories about how these uh, so-called tribal communities suddenly said that this mountain is sacred. Why? Because a mining company was coming to mine and the m my mountain becomes sacred to protect it from the mining company. So that is indigenism working as strategic essentialism to resist capital. Just going, picking up on your point about it not being a new thing. I mean, if you look at, for example, kabuki. So people think of kabuki as being something that's been untouched by outsiders. But in fact, your kabuki backdrop uh, uses um, a lot of, um, is in, very influenced by Western um, painting. Because what happened, of course, when the Portuguese ships came, the samurai banned people from going to the ships or the people from the ships coming on, on land. But people just swam. They swam and they wanted to find things. So you can see on some kabuki costumes, for example, even like little crosses, which are Portuguese in origin. Because I think the need for us to just, just go and um, engage and explore is natural to human beings. So I think you can't put indigenous people in a box because they won't want it. Um, unless they want it. Yes, unless they want it, that's true. If they feel it, it's going to encroach on them. Yeah, you save them from us.
Hello. Okay, yeah, sorry. Uh, so thank you so much for answering those sort of questions. We'll move on to our sort of next two presentation uh, in the interest of time. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. So next we have, um, no, moving on from our two very rich sort of presentations, I have grappled with the light. that has grappled with the legacies of sort of colonialism uh, towards two presentations that explores the ambition and foibles of the post-colonial nation building. Uh, the first speaker will be sort of uh, Lim Xiaoyun, who recently graduated with a degree in architecture at Yale and will be joining us at the Malaysia Design Archive uh, for a year-long sort of like fellowship where she will be principally uh, involved in developing a publication and architecture research project. Uh, she will be sharing with us a thesis project that explores the representations of Borobudur, tracing the dual tropes of the creation of the Borobudur Park and the diorama replica in the Indonesian architectural history. Uh, to understand a story of the origins of architecture between the monument and the primitive hut, as it manifests in the late Dutch East Indies and in the era of General Suharto. Thank you. So, I feel like I need to pray to Saraswati to make sure that the tech works for me this time. I can just hold it. Yeah. Or, all right. Oh. Brute force, that's how we do it. Um, okay. To kind of like preface all of this, like this is a fairly recent thought that kind of like appeared in my mind and I just like turned it into a 30 minute thing. Um, so I'm gonna like throw it at you and I'm looking forward to hearing you kind of throw it back at me later. Um, so let's begin. So while reading the internet and looking for a sort of material on a longer piece I was writing about Borobudur, I came across this really fascinating diorama um, on the Google Arts and Culture website. So it's made in 1971. It's housed in the National History Museum in Jakarta, which is at the base uh, of the National Monument. It's one of 52 dioramas. So it illustrates the construction of Chandi Borobudur, um, a 9th century AD Buddhist monument in central Java, which is, you know, to jog our memory, Borobudur's. You know, known for these like intricate bas reliefs that illustrates the life of Buddha and these you know serene sculptures of seated Buddha figures um, and really really just numerous many many stupas so yeah, just to take a moment and sort of ruminate on this diorama for a little bit let's bypass the monks in the foreground they're not that important to me what first really piqued my interest in this was these sort of weird figures at work in the middle um, they're shirtless, they're dressed in this like kind of diaper, kind of like light covering. Um, the male figures are performing this labor of carving, of cutting, of moving blocks of stone. And a figure dressed in a kind of like similar garb stands apart from the rest of the crowd. He has his head thrown back, his sort of arm flung out, and it, he's guiding the workers to a Borbador in the background while glancing at his counterpart further in the distance. And as we move deeper into the picture, we move deeper towards the monument, these sculptural figures, they kind of decrease in scale until they eventually walk into the painting. They become these black little specks against the peeling gray-blue patch that we are meant to understand as Borobudur. And in contrast, there's this hut that stands very, very prominently on a monolithic foundation. It's elevated, but really umbilically attached to the ground. There's a plastic tree that kind of emerges behind the hut to frame it. If you don't kind of look closely, you would imagine that they were kind of attached to each other as well. Four columns plant themselves onto the ground, molded and weathered to resemble wood, but honestly to me looking very much like plastic um, and sort of hammered straight. And with its pitch roof and its mortise joints, you know, the hut really screams its recognition as architecture. So this tension between the monument, Borobudur, and the primitive hut has fueled um, architectural imagination of the West for centuries. Um, it was first incepted in the 1750s. This was an argument, really, over the origins of architecture, you know, going back to the question just now. From what principles should we choose to build? 
So to very grossly oversimplify here, on one hand, and you know, um, in the 1750s we have the French rationalists, right? Here it's represented by the Francis piece of um, Marc Antoine Lorgier's essay on architecture, where a quote-unquote primitive hut is seen to be emerging out of a tree. The origin of architecture was thought to be the laws of nature. Architects were merely channels for these primordial laws. And then on the other hand, we have the empiricists, inspired by the theories of John Locke and especially prominent in the UK and Britain, uh, were concerned with the making of a theory of sensation, of this architectural sublime. In this evocation of sort of grandeur and infinity, here uh, I represented it with Piranesi's etching of the Appian Way, monuments litter the road from Rome to Egypt, tracing the idea of architectural origins historically, from the Great Pyramids to the Pantheon. The search for architectural origins, however, did not end in the 1750s um, with the rationalists or with the empiricists, and it took really new form with the birth of the nation. So in the 1970s and 80s, uh, during the New, new Order in Indonesia and the paternalistic and authoritarian General Suharto, an idea of tradition as rooted in architectural origin was reborn. Architectural tradition, um, Suharto's new order, became mobilized towards the recovery of this authentic, quote-unquote, history. One would imagine that, you know, this figure in the cartoon here, as he sort of shines his flashlight over a Greek temple, he'd perhaps flick his torch away and you know, move on and find something else. So, taking Borobudur as our protagonist here, I really want to tell a story about the search, a search for origins um, in architectural history in Indonesia through its encounters with two tropes, that of the park and of the replica. So I'm gonna flip between two time periods here, the, the sort of new order of Indonesia in the 1970s and the sort of like late period of the Dutch East Indies. But I don't intend on sort of like equalizing or you know, intend, implying that these two things are the same. Rather, I wanna show how specific narratives and formal strategies have persisted in the possession and production of an architectural imagination. Uh, tracking the sort of changing timbres of a universalist aspiration. My focus here is not on what is remembered, but how, of what implications, that, and the, what, the implications that might have on our understanding of the authentic in the architectural past. So replication via plaster casts was a European technology of knowledge that was pioneered as, and, you know, came to a head in the 19th century as part of this sort of historicist tradition, especially prominent in Britain. So many um, of the casts made by the British Empire, including this really infamous one of the Trajan Column, are now ha uh, housed at the cast courts in the v and in uh, London. So plaster casts, they were embedded in a system of historical knowledge where history could be conceived of as a systematic whole. Right, constituted by distinct and sort of homogeneous epochs, each with a character and distinctive styles. Plaster casts, you know, supposedly expose architecture as epoch-bound and site-specific. They are relative to a time, they are relative to a place. Crucially, casted reproductions were made on a one-to-one -one scale. They could neither be enlarged or made small. And this was, you know, not merely a decision of convenience, but also a pedagogical one. Unlike the photograph, which does not carry scale, the power in replication was contained in the ability of the fragment, the part, to suggest a totality, a whole. Only with this preservation of scale could come the knowledge of sub the sublime. So plaster casts were often featured at world fairs, a sort of ambitious you know, 19th century version of a biennale, uh, where nations would build pavilions to showcase their achievements. Replicas allowed architecture to travel when the buildings could not, rather than having to go to a colony to witness uh, a grand tour of architectural buildings. Um, one merely had to travel to the relatively small axis between the Trocadero and the Eiffel Tower along the River Seine. So with a regimented stroll in a park of temporary buildings, the colonial world could unfurl before you. So in 1900, for the first time, the Dutch government decided to take control of their representation at the 1900 Colonial Exposition in Paris, abandoning the practice of leaving these entries to sort of private enterprise. Standing among the pavilions of other nations, the Dutch decided to represent themselves with the East Indies. There was no national Dutch pavilion at the Rue de Nations in the 1900s. Instead, the centerpiece for the Dutch entry 
was Jandi Sari. Um, the colony became representative of the colonizer, a vision more glorious than the metropole itself. J.W. Iserman, who was formerly an engineer and a self-made archaeologist who, uh, made, uh, who discovered a kind of like hidden foot of carvings at Borobudur, bore responsibility for the temple display. So in 1898, he tasked E.A. von Seher, who was a sort of director of arts and crafts in Harlem in um, Amsterdam, to sail to the East Indies and produce casts for the pavilion. In the space of 12 months, um, Seher had made uh, casts of statues in the museum of the Batavian Society, ornaments from Jandi Sari, Jandi Sewu, Jandi Blaosan, sort of all temples in Java, and most notably for us, 25 bas reliefs of Borobudur. During the 1900 exposition, copies of Borobudur bas reliefs were also on sale for 75 francs a piece. Yet this sort of exactitude of replication did not preclude an eclectic imagination. So this is Jandi Sari as it appeared um, in the 1900 Pirates Exposition. If it looks a little odd, there's a good reason why. Uh, the original scheme was actually for a faithful recre uh, recreation of Jandi Sari as it was when it was wholly intact and you know, in its height of glory. But the end product didn't quite obey such structures. So the stone was made much lighter than the original volcanic andesite, which is sort of like dark, stormy gray. And a glass roof was placed inside the interior to allow light uh, to enter the building. You know, it's sort of like it's wholly absent from the sort of wet and dark interior just of the Jandis in Java. The base and the steps, which were pretty badly destroyed in the original, were retrofitted with that of Jandi Blawasan, or another Jandi also in Java. And I think most interestingly, the temple was placed on this sort of additional base with a wide terrace, and its sides were covered with a 26 a plaster cast of bas reliefs from Borobudur, which tell this life story of Buddha, which you know kind of echoes the hidden foot of Borobudur discovered by Aizarin. This final pavilion it has echoes of this more perfect whole, right? Jandi Sari was remade in the image of those who possessed it. As a kind of small note, another attempt was actually made to reproduce Borobudur, but this time in 1931 for the 1931 colonial exposition. This time, however, Dutch organizers wanted to reproduce Borobudur whole. Um, however, its scale was deemed too, quote unquote, impractical to reproduce, um, so these plans were eventually abandoned. Instead, the exhibition designers opted for a hodgepodge mishmash of sort of vernacular architectures. Balinese gates, Menangkabau roofs, the entire East Indies brought together into a sim single building. And here, the primitive hut rears its head. The recreational park as a tool of imparting history was an impulse that was felt once again in the 1970s and 80s by General Suharto and his wife, Tien Suharto. One of the flagship pieces of the national architecture was Taman Mini Indonesia Indah, uh, TMII, translated into Beautiful Miniature Indonesia Park. So TMI houses 26 pavilions with replicas of vernacular rumah adat, or sort of like vernacular homes from all around Indonesia. Um, this is, oops. This is one of them. Um, this is from West Sumatra. And it also houses a miniature version of Borbador, which we'll get to in a little bit. Taman Mini was the pet project of Dian Suharto, uh, President Suharto's wife, purportedly inspired by a trip to Disneyland. Um, so in an interview, she says, I was inspired to build a project of the sort in Indonesia, only more complete and more perfect, adapted to fit the situation and development of Indonesia, both materially and spiritually. Echoing this kind of like capitalist language of development and improvement, Taman Mini fulfills a recreational ideal by importing recreation into Jakarta. One can now walk through the entire geography of the nation of Indonesia, right in the heart of its administrative center. So unsurprisingly, Taman Mini was a rather unpopular project. Um, actually, the first open protests um, during the Suharto area were over the price tag of Taman Mini. It was a stunning 1.5 billion rupiah, which is about 25 million US dollars in 1971. Um, it was three times the cost of, of the restoration of Borobudur, just to give you a sense of how expensive things are. So instead of, you know, sort of um, 
capitulating, Mr. Suharto urged student protesters to contribute financially to uh, Taman Mini. And she says, if in the olden days our ancestors worked co op like Bergotong Royong, worked cooperatively together to create Borobudur, which now commands the, the attention of the entire world, today we too can mark cooperatively, I can work cooperatively to build the beautiful mini Indonesia project. So this call to the past was once again tied to this sort of like spectral presence in Borobudur. The one created at Taman Mini, however, um, the Borobudur at Taman Mini was rather different. So the 120 meter by 120 meter Borobudur um, was now represented by a miniature two by two uh, meter Borobudur under glass. It rests in the center of an open air pandapa, a sort of Javanese pavilion, uh, most often seen in royal palaces. And it's in turn surrounded by eight life-size concrete Buddhas. Again, that tension between the monument and the primitive hut. So in a storybook, though, from the Department of Education and Culture for Use in Public Schools to introduce children to, Indone to Indonesian culture, um, oops. Okay, there we go. Um, a group of school children in this sort of fictional story, they fulfill their dream of visiting Taman Mini and to see the miniature of, the, of Borobudur. So this is a student talking to her teacher. Only now am I able to clearly understand the Borobudur, said Lina, because up till now, I've just seen its photograph. With a miniature like this, we can see it in its entirety more clearly. If we went to Borobudur, what would be visible would certainly be larger, the reliefs clear, but as to which door we turned, sometimes we'd get confused. The mini Borobudur was able to offer what the monument could not hope to achieve, clarity and control. So in her now canonical book on longing, Susan Stewart, who is a sort of theorist, draws upon all these theories to claim that the experience of the miniature in an amusement park is always narratively concerned with the idea of nostalgia, with the idea of loss. For Stewart, the encounter with the miniature in a park is to erase their histories, to lose us within their presentness. Hence, the miniature is a fiction with nostalgic allusions to interiority and fictiveness, positing a transcendence which erases the productive possibilities of understanding, understanding through time. But crucially, the houses and monuments held in Taman Mini were seen as just important, just authentic, if not more authentic than their counterparts around Indonesia. Instead of traveling to other parts of Indonesia to visit the ancestral lands, residents uh, were imagined to just travel to Taman Mini instead. Stewart's formulation of the miniature breaks down when it comes to Taman Mini. Like Chandi Sari, it is a fiction that gives access to an idea of origins that is more real, more perfect, more whole. So in 1975, um, at the opening speech of Taman Mini, Indonesia Inda, Suharto exhorted that Taman Mini would guide Indonesians towards that spiritual welfare, um, in fact, which is already in our possession. It lies in our beautiful and noble national cultural heritage, personified in Jakarta by a stroll through Taman Mini, Indonesia Inda. And these are just a few other replicas that I found that I thought would be fun to put up. So in the manner of the so-called vernacular, you know, the vernacular so-called primitive hut with Taman Mini, the monument of Borobudur too had to change to become remystified as this object of post-colonial curiosity. It had to be repackaged in late 20th century narration of an in national Indonesian culture. And to that end, a park was built around the monument, uh, clearing out two villages to achieve the desired acreage and its um, invitations to eternity. The journey through the park was not merely for the body and the eye, but also for, the, for one to journey through time. The subjects around Borobudur were strictly differentiated between tourists and villagers. Where the tourists could become this agential subject of history, the villager had to be tamed and to be an object by history. So let's focus on sort of this figure of the tourist first. Um, it, it, around the park, there would be a field museum that would be built, um, and it would be found all over. Um, 
it was imagined to be a chronological mall where visitors could walk back into history, and I'm quoting directly from the report here. The mall would be for the pleasure of those who visited it. And as the report describes this experience of a presumably male visitor, as a visitor is strolling along the deeply shaded pathway wondering, perhaps, when and how the Chandi Borobudur became known to the outside world, he suddenly comes upon a brilliant display of Indonesian dynasties and construction periods. He can sit on one of the many benches or stool um, provided there in the shade for more leisurely perusal of the interesting information. Further along the way, he comes to an area commemorating the birth of Buddha, and then to a presentation regarding primitive man in Java and pre in prehistoric times, which marks the end of his journey back in time. To avoid monotony while in the Fion Museum, the sort of plan continues, the report writes that the historical scenes are to be interspersed with subtle park landscaping, with suddenly opening vistas to the countryside beyond. One encounters historical information peppered with views of the monument or to the countryside, where you know, the picturesque view of the ruin uh, was once enough to evoke this sort of historicist view of the past, firmly made past. The division between the past and the present here is made rather muddy. muddy. No longer mere imagination, the tourists would literally move back through time in this pleasant stroll, aided by the historical information being provided around him. So after this journey through time, to get back to the present, the tourist can take a number of alternative routes afforded by a complex network of small paths. Time is no longer purely forward moving. Um, it is revealed as malleable both backwards and forwards, and crucially, it is mediated by space. The contemporary tourist in walking through the Field Museum is made a central negotiator of time. And what of the villagers around the monument? Oops, okay, there we go. And one of the villages around the monument, perhaps the most quote-unquote authentic version of the fetishized primitive hut. The locals around the area were explicit, explicitly categorized as a preservation problem. A report stated that it was necessary to demand higher moral to visitors. Unclear what that phrase means. So one person I spoke to while I was at Borobudur mentioned offhand that he was actually you know, part of the, um, the village that had been cleared out to make way for the park. He was formerly a resident of Ngaran village and, and used to live with his family um, in today what is the immediate zone outside Borobudur. Proudly, he noted that his family was the last to hold out on selling their land. After resisting attempts by the government to purchase their land, he described how his father was kidnapped um, by the government for two weeks. The final straw for their family was the threat of being labeled PKI um, as communists, targeted in the 1965 genocide they eventually gave in. So in 1980, they sold their land under market price, and he now lives right outside the park near Borobudur Market. And with a final chuckle, he said to me, Begitulah zaman Suharto, right? That was Suharto's era. The strategy of the replica park had overtaken the monument. So I visited the National Monument earlier this year, and to my great delight, I found that the diorama um, that began my rabbit hole down this journey was there and had gotten a really nice swanky facelift. It had sort of risen from its plaster ashes. Restored in central Java, it also had to be restored in Jakarta. But my most fond memory of the National History Museum was when a caretaker stepped inside the diorama of Suharto speaking at the non-alignment movement. The illusion of scale, preciously reproduced in photographs, was shattered in that one moment as he kneeled on his bare feet, adjusting a fallen Suharto back onto his pedestal. And in this respect, the age-old debate of the monument and the primitive hut is really a question of who gets to tell our stories about architecture and how. The question of origin, of authenticity, of the real is too a question of power, possession, and re-narration. We tend to think about history and time as this fixed point in the past from which a future may emerge, easily managed in our calendars and our clocks. But the question of origin, of truth, of certainty, of primordiality, will always return to haunt us. The making of an architectural now, the making of an architectural experience is always dependent on the shaking scales of history. Thank you. Great, so we have our last presentation. And, uh, and uh, Atri Gupta, assistant professor from modern and contemporary South and Southeast Asian art.
at UC Berkeley. And she writes sort of like extensively on cultural networks and art in the sort of like non-aligned sort of movement and teach also like super woke courses with titles like Saying No to Imperialism, Visualizing Freedom, which you would expect to come from, come out of Berkeley, right? Uh, Atri will be presenting her research on aesthetics of abstraction in 1950s and 1960s India, principally by looking at the works of photographer Jit Maholtra and sculptor Dan Ra uh, Danraj Bhagat, uh, sorry, uh, as well as situating their art in the intersection of post-war scientific developments and the modernizing aspiration of a new nation state. Thank you. Thank you, Simon, and a, and a huge thank you for inviting us here for the workshop. It's been a wonderful seven days. Um, I want to spend the little time that we have here um, to think about the limits of art history in context of decolonization. The central question that I want to address is this. How might we rearrange and re-engage the formal aspects of artworks from a post-colonial perspective. Might two objects that look similar at face value be revealed as vastly different at a closer examination? If this indeed is the case, can we really trust our eyes? I take up my, as my case study a series of events that unfolded in 1950s and 1960s India. The Second World War was just over, and the Cold War had just ensued. India had just achieved independence from British rule. Eager to modernize, India had just embarked on the monumental project of building new industries, roadways, highways, and new modern planned cities. These serve as the backdrop of my story. Chandigarh a new capital city for the divided state of Punjab in newly independent India, designed by Lake Kabuse, plays a key role in the story. My interest, however, is not centered on architecture as such. Indeed, Kabuse, who was perhaps one of the most iconic architects of the post-war era, will only play a subsidiary role in this talk. Instead of focusing on Lake Kabuse's architecture, I plan to use Chandigarh like a mirage, an optical phenomena. The word mirage contains within it a sense of inversion and displacement. And these are precisely the kinds of things that I want to talk about today. In what follows, we will track an interrelation between the aesthetics of abstraction and the forces of industrial modernization in mid-century India. By and large, the dialectic between modernism and the post-war crisis of nuclearization has thus far functioned as a fulcrum around which our present understanding of modernism after the Second World War still remains organized. Inserting into this picture the disobedient trajectories of decolonization, my intention is to open up the debate to a different conceptual arrangement. To begin then with Lake Kabusie. By the time Kabusie arrived in India in 1951, the new country had already set forth on a course of massive large-scale industrial projects of modernization. For example, gigantic dams, heavy industries, hydroelectric projects, steel plants, locomotive factories, automobile production lines. The modern planned city of Chandigarh then joined a wide array of projects and processes undertaken to modernize the country quickly. As for Corbusier, over the subsequent decades, the architect was primarily concerned with completing the administrative structures in Chandigarh's capital complex, and we see one example here. However, although the reinforced concrete buildings in the, in the capital would become central in clinching Chandigarh's international stature 
as the mecca of modern architecture and urbanism, it was the city's low-cost housing designed by Jane Drew, a British architect in Corbusier's team, that first gave Chandigarh a prominent place in the post-colonial horizon in the early 1950s. Repeatedly captured in photography, the visual effect of these structures far exceeded their architectural potential. When, for instance, Marg, an art journal central to debates on post-colonial modernism, first published photographs of these buildings in 1953, their very form began to take an abstract aesthetic dimension. Floating on a white background, the photographs adopted a slightly oblique angle. Collectively, the photographic angle and the strategic layout of the journal's page allowed for a focus on the geometricity of the brick and concrete on the building's facade. Departing from the frontal perspective that was usually adopted for architecture photography in India, which was by and large a legacy of colonial photographic practices, the journal, whose early history is deeply interrelated with post-colonial modernism, introduced a distinctive visual vocabulary that opened up architecture photography to the possibility of abstraction. Over the subsequent decade, architecture and the aesthetics of abstraction would be drawn into an even closer bind through photography. In retrospect, 1955 emerges as a key year in this history. This was the year that Kabusia's High Court was completed in Chandigarh. The Hungarian-born French domicile photographer Lucien Erve arrived in Chandigarh to document the, the opening of this structure. The very next year, both India and Chandigarh entered the international media in a major way with international journals prominently featuring Erve's photographs of Chandigarh. There was something quite distinctive about Erve's photographs, something that set them apart from earlier representations of India that had appeared in the Western media. For instance, Margaret Burke White's now famous photographs of the partition of India and Pakistan, or Werner Bischoff's haunting photographs of the 1951 food grain crisis that had erupted shortly after. Although deeply sympathetic to the momentous transformations taking place in a newly decolonizing country, Burke White or Bischoff almost inevitably foregrounded India's poverty and the plight of its teeming millions, reiterating, as it were, not yet developed India's difference from the already industrialized West. In this sense, Burke White or Bischoff's photographs were somewhat out of step with the modernizing aspirations of the new nation state. Their photographs found limited circulation in India, perhaps for this very reason. In contrast, Irve presented the monumental mass of Chandigarh's buildings through an abstracted, fragmentary experience of space, sharply delineated by the play of light and shadow, volume and void. Irve's photographs of Chandigarh were almost inevitably devoid of human life. Except for portraits of Le Corbusier, figures were almost entirely absent. Even when figures did appear, human presence was made subservient to architecture. By highlighting and juxtaposing light and shadow, that is contrasting tones of blackness and iridescent illumination, Irve seemed to seek a complete eradication of any sentimentality. The resultant effect was a close focus on the tactile surfaces of Le Corbusier's concrete structures, stunning in the immediacy of concrete's materiality but alienating in the abstractness of the photograph's framing. As such, the Im images demanded an exacting disciplining of vision, both on part of the viewer and the photographer. The architecture photographer's issue are as much mental as they are visual. His vision must be disciplined, as Irve described it. Indeed, a constitutive disaggregation disagre of everyday vision governed these images. In other words, we see in this manner only in photography. 
only through abstraction, never in real life. In the South Asian context, such an approach to architecture photography would have been startlingly new. Never before had architecture been photographed in this manner in the subcontinent. Unlike earlier frontal photographs of monuments that circulated in the Indian media, Irvi's lens offered no knowledge, no comprehens comprehensive view of the building, so to speak, yet repeatedly circulated through art journals and government publications, Irvi's work became synonymous with Chandigarh. This is how you saw Chandigarh. The monumental architecture of Chandigarh, residential blocks that filled up entire segments of the city, or bold structures in the capital complex framed by acres and acres of empty space, perhaps formed a corpus so vast, so new, and so alien that they could perhaps only be assimilated through such a fragmentation. Or perhaps the modernizing aspirations of the new nation state could not find adequate visual expression in realism. Or perhaps the aesthetics of post-colonial development demanded a new visual vocabulary. Irvi, however, spent a very limited number of days in India. In his absence, Jeet Malhotra, then a junior architect in Le Corbusier's team, served as the architect's des designated photographer. No doubt Malhotra was well versed with Irvi's photographic strategies. The two had developed a close comradery during Irvi's visit to Chandigarh. Like Irvi, Malhotra too demonstrated an acute awareness of architecture's materiality. He even adopted several techniques that had already been utilized by Irvi. These included angular compositions, heightened juxtapositions of light and shadow, a focus on the geometry of form, and so on. But there was a crucial difference. In Irvi's photographs, depopulated images presented Ch Chandigarh's architecture in a way that was devoid of any social comment. Malhotra, in contrast, adopted the formalist premises of, of Irvi's architectonic abstraction only to obstinately repopulate the photographs with human figures. If depopulation allowed Irvi to create an image of an international vocabulary of post-war architecture, empty of any historical or regional referent, Malhotra did just the opposite. When asked by Corbusier to take photographs of the workers carrying sheet metal, the photographer took the opportunity to place the figure at the extreme foreground, making the laboring Indian body the subject of the photograph. Elsewhere, he catapulted the human body into photographic abstraction by utilizing circular passages in architecture like viewing apertures, as if the viewer had in fact placed an eye at the viewing circular aper aperture in the building. Such a framing strategy allowed Malhotra to produce a view that was intimate, even embodied, and most importantly, grounded in the everyday spaces of the city. Almost always, figures dotted Malhotra's frames, even if in the form of minuscule specks in the distance. His photographs then were not timeless. OK, lost the slide. His photographs then were not as timeless and placeless in quite the same way as the Hungarian photographer Irvis aimed to be. Malhotra's photographs of Chandigarh, in other words, could not function as a supplement for Le Corbusier's buildings in any other part of the world. This perhaps was Malhotra's intention. Because of their precision, their grounding in Chandigarh, their placidness, as it were. Malhotra's work initiated a new turn in photographic practices, one that was further developed in the hands of younger generation of architecture photographers, for example, Madan Mehta. In this sense, post-war architecture and photography shared a close affinity, as Adrian 42 has observed in the European context. This relationship then was a fundamentally global one. But in the post-colony, 
this new strand within photography would remain restricted to images of modernist architecture and the industrial landscape, underscoring a fundamental link between new abstractionist tendencies and the new topographies of post-colonial development that serves as its cultural premise and historical ground. From this cauldron of modernization also emerged sculptural abstraction. An, architect an architectonic aesthetic of abstraction found recognition in 1960s India in a new kind of sculpted form that avoided monumentality and volume to instead highlight sculpture purely as visual effect. Only a few years earlier, Clement Greenberg, the dawn of post-war modernism in America, had heralded sculpture as the representative visual art of modernism. In 1958, elucidating sculpture's optical effect, Greenberg has asserted that a building or a picture both require far greater armature than sculpture to convey an equivalent spatial effect. But sculpture can provide the greatest possible amount of visibility with the least possible expenditure of tactile surface. In contrast to tactility, solidity, mass, it was the visual qualities of sculpture that interested Greenberg the most in the post-war decades. In 1949, he had already elaborated on the intersections between sculpture and engineering. Now, Greenberg's theory of a free, complete, and total sculpture rested squarely on the medium's graphic, anti illusionist and visual potentialities. Now, it is the eyesight alone, the critic had declared. Greenberg's point of reference, of course, was David Smith, the American sculptor, whose work he had been writing about since the mid-1940s, and around whose work he had constructed an entire discourse about post-war new sculpture. But Greenberg might just as well have been speaking about Dhanraj Bhagat, whose work was exemplary of a new form of abstract sculpture that emerged in mid-century India. Bhagat himself was conversant with Smith's repertoire, having spent time in New York on a Rockefeller scholarship in 1952, the same year that MoMA organized a major symposium on new sculpture. Bhagat was well acquainted with Greenberg's description of new sculpture, yet he did not embrace new sculpture in quite the same way as Smith did or Greenberg demanded. In the 1950s, Bhagat developed a distinctive architectural sculpture that bore close resemblances to the box-like grids of Le Corbusier's architecture in Chandigarh. He, may, he was well acquainted with the architect photographer Malhotra being very involved in the Chandigarh project. The abstract photographs of Chandigarh that had been circulating in the Indian art and architecture journals was also familiar to him. The elements of construction came to obsess him. Increasingly, he turned to architectural material such as reinforced concrete, steel, aluminium and iron all of which had been quite unconventional in sculpture at the time. In his sketchbook, Bhagat began working out the relationship between positive and negative spaces. With outlines, he delineated the space that sculpture's volume perceptibly occupied. He demarcated the internal spaces of sculpture with black highlights, which he then translated into accentuations and recessions in his abstract three-dimensional box-like forms. These clustered around window-like passages that framed empty space. And all of this described in these terms sound exactly like new sculpture as Greenberg would describe it. Bhagat's work certainly inaugurated a new phase of abstraction in Indian sculpture, a phase that was in every which way a counterpart to Greenberg's new sculpture. However, in the post-colonial configuration, abstraction did not amount to an erasure of the figure. The abstract sculptures which dominated Bhagat's oeuvre appear to stand on architectural tuber-like shapes that allude to the human body. 
it is as if the human body has transformed into architecture, and architecture, in turn, has been humanized in sculpture. Consistently, Bhagat returned to the figure. But now, the figure functioned much like an allegory for architecture. Writing in 1970, Richard Bartholomew would compare the abstractionist tendencies in Bhagat's monarch with the images of nuclear fission and mutation, in other words, the image of technological excess that haunted post-war cultures. But unlike the Euro-American traditions of post-war abstraction, think Jackson Pollock, abstraction in the post-colony was never really close to figuration. Rather, its imperatives came from a certain engagement with the forces of technology, modernization and development. This made the Indian artist's conception of abstraction fundamentally different, and this difference was stubborn. It refused to go away. Even as Indian artists like Bhagat saw themselves as participating in the international field of post-war abstraction, they challenged the ways in which abstraction had been framed in Europe or North America. This challenge was most perceptible in 1967, when Clement Greenberg arrived in New Delhi with two decades of American painting, a CIA-sponsored traveling exhibition of American art, the largest and most compre comprehensive exhibition of American art to be shown outside of the United States until the time. The exhibition unfolded within a Cold War world that was tersely stretched between the United States and Soviet Russia, that is capitalism versus communism, abstraction versus realism. According to the exhibition's official catalog, the primary aim of two decades was to make visible the spirit of freedom that purportedly made America distinct from the communist world. And there was a, there was a particular reason why this exhibition was sent out in the first place. Uh, the non-aligned movement had just been formed, and this exhibition, in a certain sense, was responding to that. In India, both the art critic, that is Clement Greenberg, and the CIA-sponsored art exhibition, that is Two Decades of American Painting, received responses ranging from utter incomprehension, ambivalence, to outright rejection. The paintings in the exhibition were described by Indian audiences as decadent, boring, inexplicable, tragic. If Greenberg presented the American paintings on display as exemplary of art's ability to be self-referential, pure, autonomous, Indian artists and critics described the exhibition as conveying the exasperation, depression, and anger of an entire generation of Americans. Greenberg's appeal that all contextual content be suspended in favor of pure form, found little resonance in, in India, where building, that is construction, modernization, development, rather than pure form, was still the predominant intellectual and political concerns. Thus, even as Indian artists perceived themselves as equal players in post-war art, Greenberg's claim that art's separation from lived politics seemed entirely facile. Greenberg, on his part, found post-war Indian abstraction to be lacking an essence of Indianness. Paradoxically to him, post-war Indian abstraction looked remarkably similar to art produced in North America, the proverbial center of post-war abstraction. In contrast, Greenberg was drawn to the pre-modern Indian art, especially the Taj Mahal, where he may have discovered a distinctive Indianness that he also sought in post-war Indian art. Explicitly, he drew attention to the question of exportability of art. By this, he meant a visible quality that supposedly marked art produced in specific regions and set it apart from art produced elsewhere. When he saw the work of Dhanraj Bhagat, during his visit to the National Gallery of Modern Art in New Delhi, the sculptor's abstract forms seemed to, seemed to him to be only derivative of David Smith. As Greenberg and his Indian interlocutors 
stood facing each other in India, they seemed unable to find, come to any kind of consensus. I want to end here to leave you with this photograph, precisely because I believe that the conundrum that this encounter demonstrates points to a certain tension that lies at the very heart of art and decolonization in the 20th century. In retrospect, it seems that the problem lay not in the works of art themselves, but rather in what Greenberg saw when he looked at mid-century Indian art and how he interpreted what he saw using a set of terminologies such as realism, abstraction, figuration, surface, flatness, and so on. His interpretation, of course, was based on a certain understanding of a particular history of European and North American art. And consequently, his conception of abstraction was also very specific. Yet, when the artists in the post-colony looked at the same works of art and invoked the same terms, abstraction, realism, figure, ground, positive space, negative space, and so on, they meant something quite different. How then do we negotiate such a seemingly counterintuitive play between the similarity of form and the constitutive difference that shaped their conception? How could we, in retrospect, ever hope to unpack, unravel, rewrite, or even curate this complex history of decolonization and post-war art? To access this story, we must begin, it seems to me, by first forgetting everything that we have learned from Euro-American art history. Only then can we perhaps look again, this time with fresh eyes, leaving aside all the Eurocentric assumptions that have accumulated in words like abstraction. Thank you. Uh, in the interest of sort of like saving time, just because we're running very, very, very late, uh, do we have any questions from the floor? Um, maybe uh, to get you to sort of like, uh, one way to, to, to start a conversation is to get you to maybe, uh, in reflecting uh, this morning's sort of like presentations, as well as also the afternoon, uh, uh, the, this morning's sort of like panel discussion, as well as the afternoon presentation, uh, in relation to your work, uh, 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 it's kind of like, you know, uh, the work that you sort of like uh, shared with us, like uh, how you're talking about um, like how photos, two different sort of like photo, photos, photographic sort of like practices are able to mediate two very sort of like different discourses on architecture um, in the choice of whether to include the human figures or not. Or, and also in shelves of like presentation where she talks about the circulation of representation of Borobudur in the, both the colonial and post-colonial sort of like um, uh, states registered the monument in very differently in sort of like public imagination. I guess you're also sort of like suggesting uh, in some ways there's so many multi there's so many different kinds of like genealogies that we're able to sort of like trace uh, 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 for, for, for each of the sort of like topic that we're working on, we're able to trace out really multiple sort of like genealogies from them, right? And this insistence that there are other ways of sort of like accounting for the subject that you're working on, how, how do you sort of like see this as a way to maybe think about what we've been sort of exploring over the past week with um, participants and the workshop? I know it's a sort of like broad sort of like way of framing the question, but I. I, I thought that at least I think both your, talk, both your talks were very sort of, uh, I made very sort of strong points about uh, uh, thinking about genealogy, genealogy, the question of genealogy in its most uh, multiple and generous sense of the term. Um, whether you have anything to add to that. Well, I'd, 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 I'd like to respond anecdotally. So how does this, particular segment that I shared today, how this came about was that I spent, I was in Chandigarh trying to research these, uh, both the city and um, a larger practice of abstraction that was coming out of the city that was responding to the city. Um, and I walked the streets. That was 
primarily my research. I walked the streets for a good month and I took hundreds of photographs. Um, after a point I realized that the, the city that I was seeing with my eyes and with colored images that I was taking was rather different from what the artists were responding to. The photographs of Ch Chandigarh that would have circulated would have been black and white photographs. So then I found myself take, starting to take black and white photographs. And without even realizing what it is that I was doing, um, I came to realize that the photographs that I was taking was actually, actually ended up looking like, looking very much like what Irvi had shot. Um, which led me to conclude that our understanding of the city is so caught up with photography um, that perhaps Chandigarh is that only in photography. Um, and I also came to realize how different these photographs were and how different the city of Chandigarh was and, and uh, archival documents certainly testify to that. It looks like no other Indian city. Um, it was really exemplary, uh, unique and onto itself. So I think a lot of conclusions that we draw either as historians, as art historians or as creative practitioners uh, come from a combination of archival research, a combination of history, but also a sort of attempt to step into other people's shoes, to see through somebody else's eyes. And that vision is a, his, is a historical vision. Um, that's not my vision. Um, but that's also genealogy. And given that in no South or Southeast Asian context, you can't really trace abstraction through impressionism, cubism, and so on. That, that narrative doesn't give. Um, in the absence of that narrative, then we, we are left to our, it, we're, it's on us how we want to recreate the narrative because that genealogy clearly isn't ours. Mm -hmm. um, so what is? So I don't know if that, if that actually answers. Yeah, I mean, that was beautifully answered. Um, I tend to think of sort of all the material out there as kind of like rock climbing wall. So if you know, like if you've been rock climbing, there are like all these different color pathways that you can like take to reach the top. And it's a matter of sort of choice of which color pathway you decide to take. But um, if you know, it's for some reason you had like a black and white lens that was put in your entire world and you were looking at this rock climbing wall for the first time, like that's how I feel starting out a project. And there are sort of an infinite number of forms in which a project can take. And when I say form, I mean like a piece of academic research, you know, a piece of art, um, theater, music, dance, or otherwise. I think sort of the forms of production are always kind of adjacent to each other in that sense. Um, in terms of sort of creating genealogies, like it's, I suppose the sort of genealogies that have spoken most to me are rather similarly, I think things that are empathetic, right? It allows a kind of like, um, for me at least, academic writing is very emotional. It's very um, sort of touchy-feely. It's not about the sort of state documents of the past, but imagining ourselves in a world that um, is almost animated by them. So which academic book has made you cry? <laughs> uh, Anna Singh, Friction. <laughs> Honestly, is like the most touching book of academic writing I've read in the recent past. And, and to, to add something very quickly, the lack of a genealogy is not a bad thing, it's actually a great thing. Mm -hmm. um, I, was tr my, I, I was partly trained in India as an art historian. Um, and the, honestly, aside from formalism, the only other thing that I really learned was to believe nothing. Mm. Um, and I take that very seriously. Believe nothing you read, believe no one. How did, how did they cultivate that kind of like belief in... Uh, is that a program that you sort of like specifically under? This was an artistry program. Um, this used to be an excellent artistry program. Um, and the benefit of believing nothing, believing no one, and having no genealogy until you construct it for yourself, there's, there's incredible freedom in that. Um, and that's where you can dial back to zero and start again. Yeah. Um, 
Great. No, that's why I think I enjoy your company so much because like, the, the, there's not there's sort of almost no allegiances to very specific kind of like genealogy. I like a lot of the American sort of academic sort of system, which tends to sort of train people to think within one intellectual sort of lineage, right? The most obvious questions are the, and the more, most interesting ones, are the ones that never get asked because they seem too simple. Does anyone have sort of like any question? Yeah. Sorry, yes. You're saying that um, if you could repeat that last sentence that you said, the most interesting questions are the ones that are, are most simple because people don't ask them. Is that what you said? Can um, you give I, an example of that? Yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm, I, I, in my own work, I usually find myself starting with really what would really be stupid questions like, okay, there have been 10 books written on this subject, but why is this color here, not there? It can be something as simple as that. That was a really bad example. What, what do you mean? Um, what is this called? <laughs> <laughs> okay, a better example would be, um, so I've been working on, um, I broadly work on what I call third world modernism, and I've been working on a manuscript by a particular artist where the manuscript was completed in 1930s. There's a, there's an abs there's a collage in the manuscript, it's an artist book, that shows very explicitly an instance of Afro-Asian alliances. Now, art historians have usually tended to see this as a playful um, engagement with form. Because in 1930s, what Afro-Asian alliance? Um, for that, we have to come down to, the 19, to 1955. But that didn't seem to satisfy me because Nothing is that simple. Why is this, what is this black guy doing in this manuscript? Um, and so, in that sense, that was, that was a very stubborn kind of a question, but a very, and any academic would probably tell you it's, it was a stupid one. Uh, but that ended up being perhaps the most productive question I could ask. Mm. Okay, thank you very much. That's a great answer. Um. Do we have maybe one last question so that we can, I know we're all sort of like very tired, so uh, maybe one last question to wrap up today? And if not, um, please join me in thanking our two sort of like speakers. Thank you so much for staying the entire day. I know how uh, uh, tiring it can be to just sort of like uh, be in a hall and listening to it. But I hope the conversation has been very enriching and stimulating and uh, please uh, sort of like stay on, have a chat with our speakers, uh, they're still around here. And um, uh, I wanna sort of like just quickly sort of like thank uh, Chindana, uh, University of Malaya, Ilham uh, Gallery and uh, Malaysia, De Malaysia Design Archive for uh, helping put together this week long sort of like learning program uh, which consists of a workshop and a public symposium. Uh, uh, title like a country of four outliers and it's part of a sort of like training program that we hope will uh, we'll be able to improve on and, uh, and and probably sort of like uh, see uh, find 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 uh, fine tune it a little bit better and sort of like improve on this and sort of like see if there's another opportunity to sort of like continue to sort of wrap this in the future thank you